All right, in this video, we're going to take a look at one of the kinetics quizzes that we did in class for grade 12 chemistry. Um, I'll work this through with you. If you want to pause and, and try the questions yourself, that would be great. If you just want to use this as a review for your test or exam, that's great as well. So um, we're asking question one, given a potential energy diagram. I'll just move this over so you can see it here. So we have here a potential energy diagram that shows reactants and products and then several hills in the, in the, in the middle of the diagram. And we're asked um, how many steps are in this reaction mechanism. Well, you remember that each step is represented as one of these hills in the diagram. So this first hill would be the first step of the mechanism. This is the second step, and this is the third step. So there's three steps in the mechanism. You recall that the reaction mechanism simply refers to the sequence of steps, the sequence of collisions that makes up the overall reaction process. Which step in the mechanism is the rate determining step? Well, I know that that's the slowest step of the mechanism, but how do I tell that from a diagram? Well, what I'm looking at here is I'm looking for the reaction step that has the largest activation energy. The activation energy for step one, well, the reaction started with a potential energy here, and it went to an activated complex here at the top of that hill. So that arrow, EA number one, is the first activation energy. The second step started here, and its activated complex is up here at the top of the second hill, so it has a very, very small activation energy. And the third step starts here, and goes to the top of this hill where there's a third activated complex and therefore that's its activation energy in step three. And of course we're just looking here at the forward reaction. Looking at those three activation energies, the third one is, is clearly the largest, therefore that third step will be the slowest step of the mechanism. Um, the second one was the smallest, so the second step here would be the fastest step of that mechanism. The rate determining step is the slowest step of the mechanism. It determines the overall rate of the reaction. So it has the largest activation energy, and that would be step number three in this diagram. The balanced equation for the overall reaction. Well, you might have a little hard time seeing this in the video. It's, the print is a little bit small. But it's uh, showing here initially with reactants hydrogen and iodine, H2 and I2. And then over here in the final products, we see two HIs. That's all I need to see to tell you what the overall reaction is. So it's going to be the reactants, H2 and I2. And they're becoming, those overall products, two HIs. There's the overall reaction. Now notice we could actually tell from this diagram because it's labeled very clearly, we could see what the actual reaction mechanism is. And I'm gonna write that up at the top at the top of the page. In the first step, we're seeing H2 and I2, and then on the other side of this diagram we see an H2 and a two I's at the end of that first step. So right here it says H2 and two I's. If you've got the printed diagram, it's, it's uh, better for you. So if I cancel out what's the same on both sides of that first step, that'll be the H2, whatever's left would be the first step of the mechanism. So step number one, the H2s are going to cancel, so I'm left with I2 becomes two I's. So that's what's going on in this first step of the process. In the second step, it begins with the H2 and the two I's and finishes with H2I and an I. So if we cancel out again what's the same on both sides, that would be one of the I's, then what's left is the reaction for step two. So it would be H2 reacts with an I and becomes H2I. And then the third step, says H2I plus an I becomes two HIs. So it starts with H2I and I and finishes with two HIs. So therefore, the H2I reacts with an I and becomes two 
hydrogen iodides, HI. So there's the overall process. And now we can actually jump down to part E of this, of this little quiz, give the formula of one intermediate in the reaction's mechanism. Well, if I look up at my three-step process, an intermediate, you recall, is something that's produced in an early step. So it's going to be on the product side of the reaction in an early step, but then it's used up as a reactant in a later step. So they cancel out. So notice here we have two I's, and there's two I's that are canceling out here. So they're produced in step one, and they're used up in steps two and three. So I would be one of our intermediates. H2I is a product in step two, but then in step three it's used up also. So H2I would also be an intermediate, something produced in an early step and then used up again later. So the two intermediates were I and H2I. We had only asked for one of them. Okay? Notice that if you look up here and see what, whatever we didn't cancel out, so on the left we have an H2 and an I2, and on the right we have just the two HIs, and so there's my overall reaction that we described in Part C. Is the first step of the reaction mechanism endothermic, meaning it absorbs energy, absorbs heat, or is it exothermic, which would mean it's releasing heat, releasing energy? Well, we're talking about the first step. So we look at the diagram and we see that the first step begins here with H2 and I2, and it ends up here. So that difference between the reactants and the products of the first step in our notes, we've called that delta H for step one, and that's the heat of reaction. And so in this case, because it's going up, the products of the first step have more energy than the reactants did, then they must have absorbed energy. Another way to say that is that delta H for step one is positive because it's increasing. So if it's positive, then the reaction is endothermic. So endothermic because delta H for step one is positive, or you could say because the products of step one have more energy than the reactants did. Do not simply tell me, though, if you're explaining that it's endothermic because it absorbed energy. I wouldn't accept that explanation because that's just telling me the definition of endothermic. It doesn't tell me that you understood that it was endothermic from the diagram. For question number two, we are shown another potential energy diagram, and we want to answer some questions here with numbers. Now, I'm not sure if you can see these numbers in the video, but this is 100 kilojoules, 200 kilojoules, 300 kilojoules, and 400 kilojoules. So see if you can pause the video and determine what the activation energy is for this reaction, the heat of reaction, and tell me whether it's an endothermic or exothermic process, and then what's the potential energy for the transition state in this reaction? Well, I can tell that this, because it has only one hill, one bump, that it must be a single step process. So we're just talking about reactants becoming products. And I can just label everything here. In this process, the, the reactant particles collide and the potential energy increases until they form the transition state, Ts, which can also be called the activated complex, AC. It's the same thing. The difference in energy from the reactants, where they began, to that transition state is what we refer to as the activation energy, Ea. Since there's only one step, we'll just say Ea. In the diagram above, with multiple steps, we said Ea number one, Ea number two, etc. The difference in energy from the reactants to the final products that difference is referred to as the heat of reaction, and we just call it delta H. It can also be called more properly the enthalpy change, but in grade 12 chemistry, we usually just refer to it as heat of reaction. Under conditions of constant pressure, enthalpy change is the same as heat. So heat of reaction. Now that I've labeled everything, answering these questions is pretty easy. The activation energy, started at 300 and went up to 400, so that difference, that arrow, would be 100 kilojoules. 
the delta H started at 300 here and went down to 100, so that difference is negative. It's dropping by 200 kilojoules. Because it's negative, it must be an exothermic process, so it's producing heat. If you were holding this in a, in a test tube and it was reacting, you'd feel that there was uh, heat produced, it would get hot. The potential energy of the transition state, well, the transition state is up here. Again, it could be also called the activated complex. Its potential energy is simply at 400 kilojoules. All right, so what are the four factors that affect the rates of chemical reactions? And why don't you try also explaining one of them using collision theory? So you should have said that the concentration of the reactants can affect the rate, and they affect the rate because if you increase the concentration, there'll be more particles present, so there'll be more collisions happening. The frequency of, collision, of collisions increases. With more collisions happening, there'll be more successful collisions, and therefore the rate of the reaction will be faster. You could also influence the temperature. You can change the temperature of the system if you want to affect the rate. If you increase the temperature, this will increase the average kinetic energy of the particles in the container. So with more kinetic energy, they're going to move faster. If the particles are moving faster, again, there will be more collisions happening. The frequency of collisions will go up. Therefore, again, the number of successful collisions will go up and the rate would increase. But on top of that, if the particles are moving faster, then more of the collisions happening will have the required activation energy. And so there's another reason for the um, rate to go up because you've increased the temperature. A third factor affects solid reactants. You could increase the surface area of the reactants. And again, that only applies to solids. Um, you can increase surface area by grinding up the solid to a powder or cutting up into small pieces. When you, in, when you cut up into smaller pieces, the total combined surface area goes up. And why does that increase the rate? Well, with more surface area, this is similar to concentration, with more surface area, there'll be more places for collisions to happen. With more collisions happening, the number of successful collisions will increase and the rate will increase as well. The last factor that we had in our notes was the addition of a catalyst. You could also say the addition of an, an inhibitor, if you like, which is the opposite of a catalyst. But the catalyst, by definition, is something that will increase the rate of a reaction. Now, how does it do that? It changes the reaction's mechanism. And in this new reaction mechanism, the, the activation energy is lower than without the catalyst. With a lower activation energy, more of the collisions will be successful, and so the rate of the reaction will go up. So there's the four major factors that can affect rates explained using collision theory. What's the relationship between an activation energy and the rate of a reaction? Well, we talked about that earlier. The activation energy is sort of like the price you have to pay for a successful collision. Um, so if it's a higher activation energy, fewer of the collisions will be successful and they're at a given temperature. Therefore, the rate will be slower. So the larger the activation energy is, the slower the rate will be. Or the smaller the activation energy, the more collisions will be successful. So therefore, a smaller activation energy will result in a faster reaction. All right, on the back of this quiz, the last few questions refer to this reaction, and we're in this reaction, we are dissolving magnesium metal in hydrochloric acid, and it's producing magnesium chloride dissolved, and hydrogen gas is bubbling out. And it looks like we're collecting the hydrogen gas and measuring its volume over time. So here we have volume in cubic centimeters, time in seconds, and it shows two different curves. One of them was done with a 0.5 mole per cubic decimeter is the same as moles per liter, so that's a 0.5 molar solution of acid. And then this other curve re refers to a 1 molar solution of acid. So in, we can see right away that in the 1 molar 
concentration, the rate of the reaction was faster than in the half molar, and that's in line with our factors that we just discussed. So part question number five says, what was the average rate of production of the hydrogen gas um, in the first 50 seconds of the experiment with 0.5 molar acid? So we want an average rate for the first 50 seconds of the reaction for 0.5 molar acid. So how would you do that? Well, an average rate is always over an interval of time. So in this case, over the first 50 seconds would mean from the start of the reaction, so when we had 0 seconds and 0 cubic centimeters, and then at 50 seconds, it said over the first 50 seconds, so I'll put a point there, and its coordinates from the graph would be 50 seconds, and then reading the volume, it appears to be about 36 cubic centimeters. So if you want to pause the video now and see if you can calculate the average rate of the reaction, go for it. So average rate, you remember, is a slope. So what I'm going to do is calculate the slope from that graph using those two points that we just labeled. So slope is the difference in y values divided by the difference in x values. So the two y coordinates there were 36 cubic centimeters minus 0 cubic centimeters, and then the times were 50 seconds minus 0 seconds. Notice I'm keeping units in my slope. So if you grab a calculator and evaluate that, or just do some mental math, 36 over 50 ends up being 0 0.72 cubic centimeters per second. Now we want to do the same thing for question 6 for the same time interval, the first 50 seconds, but this time using the 1 molar acid. So we claimed earlier that just looking at the graph, the 1 molar acid appeared to be reacting faster. Now we're going to prove that. So at the, they, they share the same initial point, and now at 50 seconds here, the volume of, of gas produced was about 58 cubic centimeters. So if you want to go ahead and again calculate the average rate using those coordinates. So the average rate is again the slope between those two points. Slope is the difference in y's over the difference in x's. So this time we have 58 cubic centimeters of gas minus zero cubic centimeters, and the time interval is the same as it was earlier. So 58 divided by 50 ends up being 1.16 cubic centimeters per second. And again, that's consistent that the rate with the higher concentration of acid is faster than the rate with the lower concentration over the same time interval. Now, what is the most likely explanation for the plateau that started at 60 seconds with the 1 molar acid? So looking up here, okay, so we have 1 molar acid. Whoops, I'm shaking that graph a bit. So with the 1 molar acid, 60 seconds, you notice that the graph began to plateau there. So why would that be? What's the most likely explanation for that? Well, remind yourself of what we were doing. We were taking a piece of magnesium metal and dissolving it in hydrochloric acid, and we were collecting the volume of gas produced. Well, what does it mean if the graph is plateauing? Well, it means that the volume suddenly is not changing, so the slope at that point is zero, isn't it? The slope of a horizontal line is zero. So that means the rate of the reaction there is zero, or at least appears to be zero. So therefore, we were thinking, what would cause the reaction to stop? The, the rate is now zero. Well, the most likely reason that it would stop producing hydrogen gas is that the magnesium metal or the acid has been used up. If we assume it was a small piece of magnesium, the most likely one would be that the magnesium metal has completely dissolved, or completely reacted, would be a 
better way to say that. It's not really dissolving, but it's completely reacted, so it's like a limiting reagent. So once it is gone, the reaction stops, and you can't produce any more gas. So therefore, the volume plateaus. And finally, we're asked that the experiment were repeated with the one molar acid, but this time at a higher, sorry, with the same temperature. So we have the same piece of magnesium, same mass of magnesium. It's being put into the same one molar acid and at the same temperature. But now the magnesium metal has been cut up into some small pieces before it's been added to the acid. So the same mass of, of metal um, put into the same amount of acid, same concentration of acid, same temperature. But the only thing different now is that the metal has been cut up into some small pieces, and we're asked to sketch what the graph would look like for that reaction. Well, if it's the same mass of magnesium and the same amount of acid, and then the volume of gas produced should be the same. So I'm expecting that the graph will plateau again at 60, 60 cubic centimeters. However, if the magnesium were cut up in small pieces, its surface area is going to be larger. And so with a larger surface area, the reaction's rate should be faster. So now the magnesium is going to produce hydrogen gas at a faster rate. So it'll increase faster, but it should plateau at the same point there. So that dotted line I've drawn would be the, a, a good estimate of the reaction with cut up magnesium metal with all the other variables that could affect the rate held constant. So with a cut up metal, greater surface area, faster rate of reaction. So there you have it. There's one of the quizzes that we did for kinetics in grade 12 chemistry.